Access to funding is one of the most frustrating business problems for entrepreneurs. There are thousands of bright and brilliant business ideas out there, but the entrepreneurs behind them just can't find the funds they need to bring those ideas to life. There are also millions of small and mid-sized businesses across the world that have great potential, but they just can't find the funds they need to get their business to the next level, to grow the business, to scale the business, or even to expand the business. If funding is a problem for you, whether you've started a business or you're just about to start a business, the things you're about to learn in this introduction course will open your eyes and open, to you, and open your mind to the interesting and innovative ways that entrepreneurs around the world are getting around the funding problem. Now, according to the Small Business Administration, it's estimated that 20% of new businesses actually fail in their first year. And the biggest reason for this is limited access to funds. Some of these are bright ideas, but just because they, didn't, they don't have the funds that they need, they just couldn't fly. And by the fifth year, the SBA estimates that another 50% of businesses actually crumble and crash because they run out of money, because they're having trouble um, growing the business, because they, they don't have access to funds. And by the 10th year, only about 20% of businesses that started 10 years ago are able to survive. Now, what does this mean for you? What it means is that only about 20% of businesses will actually survive this, this race because of the funding problem. And this is why fundraising is a key survival skill for entrepreneurs. If you plan to last in business, if you plan to succeed in business, no matter what kind of business you're trying to build, if it's a tech business, an agribusiness, a fashion business, real estate, whatever kind of business you want to build, the ability to raise funds when you need it, whether you're trying to start the business or you've already started the business, the ability to raise funds is a critical survival skill for entrepreneurs. Those entrepreneurs who have lasted in the game have this critical skill. And in the course of this, of this course, I'm going to be showing you how some of them have actually done it. So why should you listen to this? Um, hi, my name is John Paul Iwoha. I am a business transformation specialist for startup and growth enterprises. I'm the founder and CEO at uh, Small Starter Africa. I used to work for one of the top uh, global four big consulting firms, PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. I'm a chartered accountant, ACCA uh, UK. I have almost a million followers on LinkedIn. And in 2018, LinkedIn announced me as one of the top global voices on startups and entrepreneurship. I have worked with dozens of entrepreneurs in different countries across the African continent to start, grow and scale their businesses. I have been featured on several media uh, from CNN to LinkedIn Polls to TRT World to the Huffington Post, Business Day and, and several others. But it's not my profile that I think should impress you. What really should, what you really should look at is my ability to provide results or get results for my students and clients. This is just a snapshot. There are dozens of them. In the course of the last seven to eight years, I have helped my clients and students raise over $5 million. Many of them are awardees of um, several different distinguished um, um, institutions. Many of them have raised prize money. Many of them have raised equity. Some of them have raised debts. I've also trained more than 50,000 people across the African continent. Uh, through physical and virtual sessions. I've spoken to local and international audiences in West Africa, in North Africa, Central and South Africa. And the interesting thing I'm going to teach you in this introduction course is the framework that I use for helping my clients and my students get these results when it comes to raising money. And now the main reason why I came up with a roadmap is that when you ask people who have raised money, how did you do it? I'm usually quite disappointed that many of them put it down to luck or maybe they were favored or something. So what the roadmap is, is it's a five step process. It's a process oriented framework that if you follow the five steps, you are going to get the results you're looking for, which is to raise money. Now, the very first step, which we're going to cover in this in this introduction course is to understand the basics. Now, by understanding the basics, what I mean is many people who are trying to raise money do not speak the language that investors understand. 
Many people who are trying to raise money are not investment ready. They don't even understand what investment readiness is. And that is why you get a lot of complaints from investors that, you know, people come to them with business proposals, but those businesses are not investment ready. Now, in this introduction course, you're going to understand what being investment ready is because I'm going to really cover most of the basics of what you should know if you're going to raise money successfully from investors, whether they're a bank or whoever. The second step of the roadmap is to know your risk profile. The reason most businesses, most entrepreneurs are not able to raise money is because they are just too risky. Now, but what does risk mean? When an investor says, I can't invest in you because you're too risky, what does that mean? What does that even mean? You're going to understand what that means when you go through the roadmap and you understand what's involved. The third step of the roadmap is to target the right investors. Now, one of the major reasons why people do not raise money is that they waste a lot of time knocking on the wrong doors. Now, the thing is, it doesn't matter how long you knock on the door or how persistently you knock on the door. As long as you're knocking on the wrong door, you're never going to raise the money you're looking for. Not every investor is a good fit for you right that's the way it works not every investor is likely to give you money there are different kinds of investors that are focused on different kinds of businesses at different stages of business so you need to really understand the right investor for your kind of business for your stage of business and for the kind of money you're looking for and in this um, in, in the roadmap by the time we go through this introduction course you're really going to understand what it means by uh, what it means to target the right investors and then the fourth step of the or the fourth step of the roadmap is to craft compelling proposals the the process the the competition for raising money is fierce it is it is strong there are a lot of people who are looking for money so you cannot afford to be boring now like you're going to find out later in this in this introduction course the process of raising money is not about begging for money and unfortunately that's what most people do they ask for money they say they need money nobody cares what you need anybody can need money anybody can want money the goal is that you are able to sell your business as an investment opportunity to the investor and that's why crafting uh, compelling proposals is very important and you're going to learn a bit more about that uh, later on in this course and then the fifth and final step very important step that a lot of people neglect is closing the deal it's happened to many people i know they pitch their business opportunity to an investor the investor likes it but then the money never comes in you wait for one day three days one week the money never comes in what happened now closing the deal is very important because you cannot raise money until that money actually hits your bank account and in, in closing the deal, I'm really going to open your eyes to some of the common mistakes that people do, that people make when they, you know, they drop the ball essentially and they are unable to, 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 to raise the money that they want. So in this introduction course, I'm going to focus on helping you understand the basics, helping you speak the language that investors understand, helping you to come across as an investment opportunity to a potential investor. And that's why in this course in this intro course we're going to be covering the understanding of the basics but before we go ahead there's something really important we need to cover and that is the mindset the mental roadblocks so in over a decade of working with entrepreneurs i used to think it's the mechanical stuff you know like the kind of things they teach in business school understanding finance understanding accounts and things like that but that's not really what makes the people who actually raise money successful the mindset plays a big role a very big role in your ability to eventually raise money and before i even go into the meat of this of this introduction course we just need to go through the mindset stuff and by the time we go through you're really going to understand why this is important so if you have any of these mental roadblocks it's going to be really difficult for you to raise money so i think this is the best time to address it the very first mental roadblock is unrealistic expectations and this is very common for people who are trying to raise money i often get it where people say for example i want to raise one million dollars to start my business you know now you can want anything but you know who, who's really going to give you one million dollars to start your business so one question i ask is this all you have is a business idea yes you're excited by your business idea you think it's going to really make you fo uh, famous and wealthy and all that but the question is this, if an investor gives you $1 million, 
and all you have is an idea. What happens if that business doesn't work? What do you lose? Now, the investor loses $1 million, but what do you lose? You only lose an idea. And how much is an idea worth? I'm sure any entrepreneur who's worth uh, his souls comes up with business ideas every single day. Entrepreneurs always have business ideas. Business ideas cost nothing. So if you're asking somebody to give you a million dollars or any outsized or outrageous amount and you're bringing very little to the table, then it is an uneven relationship and nobody's really going to give you that. That's not how it works. But in real life, this is really how it works. People who raise money, raise money in steps. And they raise money because they hit certain milestones over time. And we're going to cover some of these important milestones. But this is really how it happens. By the time you see that successful entrepreneur in the magazine, on the back of a glossy magazine, you know, that they raise money, or you see them on social media, you really do not see the steps or the amounts of money, the smaller amounts of money they raise before they raise a large amount of money. So in reality, nobody's just going to give you a very large amount. You, you have to go through the you have to go through the ranks and you have to hit specific milestones. So unrealistic expectations is one major roadblock that gets in the way of people who are trying to raise money. And I hope that by making this very clear to you, you need to look at raising money in terms of milestones. Nobody's just going to give you um, any amount of money you want just because you want it. The second mental roadblock is the common statement that people make that nobody wants to give me money. Nobody wants to give me money. The banks don't want to give me money. Nobody believes in me. Nobody wants to give me money. Now, I hate to break it to you, but the truth is nobody owes you money, right? You have a business idea. You want to fund it. It's your problem, really. Nobody owes you money. The banks don't owe you money. No investor owes you money. Even your friends and family don't owe you money. Now, it's only a beggar. It's only somebody who's begging for money that thinks other people owe them money. Raising money is not about begging because beggars get little or nothing. Raising money is about selling. It's about selling your idea, your business, your startup as an investment opportunity. If you beg for money, you get nothing. If you sell your business as an investment opportunity, then you get people interested. So the real question is, is your business an investment ready opportunity? And in this introduction course and in the advanced course that follows, you're really going to understand what it means to be investment ready so that you look appealing to potential investors, so that investors want to give you money and not just you begging for money. Now, the third mental roadblock is this common belief that capital is scarce. Now, I just want to get this out of the way. This is a very big lie. Now, businesses raise billions of dollars every year, all kinds of businesses in all kinds of industries. And why? Now, the truth is, it is much easier to raise money today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Money is much more mobile. You can send money from the US to a country in Africa, and it's going to take you uh, uh, between a couple of hours and a couple of days, right? Money is much more mobile. There's much more money flowing around the world. The economies of the world are, the economies of the world are growing. So anybody who tells you that capital is scarce, there's really a lot of money that's moving around that's looking for investment opportunities. And I'm going to explain to you why there's much more money moving around today that's looking for opportunities to invest. So here's the thing. If you want to get through the funding problem, it's very simple. You just need to know where to find the money and how to attract the money. And that's exactly what I'm going to be showing you in this introduction course and in the advanced course that comes um, after this. Now, let's look at the fourth mental roadblock, which is what if I fail? Now, I, I just have to get this out of the way and I'm going to be really candid with you. The competition for raising money is very fierce. There are other bright people like you. There are other intelligent people like you who think their ideas stand a chance and they're also asking for the same money. There are other people like you who have small businesses, whose businesses have potential that can grow, that are, you know, that, that are serving customers, that have great products, that have great services. They deserve the money just as much as you do. So that's why the competition for funding is fierce. And the truth is, 
you will likely get rejected a couple of times before you actually raise money. It happens in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a place where people think, you know, investors throw money at entrepreneurs. But even the average entrepreneur in Silicon Valley has to try more than a dozen times, more than a dozen times before they raise any money. So the winning strategy is to learn from your rejections. Are you going to get rejected? Yes, it's a given. But here's what I tell entrepreneurs. When you're trying to sell a product to a customer, what do you do when the first person says, no, I'm not interested? Most entrepreneurs I know move on to the next person. And if the next person says no, they move on to the next person. But what I find is when it comes to raising money, entrepreneurs behave in a very strange way. They try, they, they, they make their first attempt to raise money. And if it doesn't go through, they start to grumble that, you know, nobody wants to give them money. It's still the same process you take with your customers. It's the same process you take when you're trying to get a distributor on board to move your products for you. It's the same process you take when you're trying to get a supplier to do business with you. You have to keep on selling. Are you going to get rejected? Yes. It is a normal part of the process. But the goal is the more you, you have to learn from your rejections because that way your next attempt will be better than the last one and the next one will be better than the last one and eventually that's how you raise money now when you see successful entrepreneurs who have raised money you don't see the number of times they tried and failed and that's the irony of it so my goal here as as a person who works with entrepreneurs who have raised money is to show you the backstory to let you know that most people don't raise money on their first attempt, on their fifth attempt, or even on their tenth attempt. You have to keep on trying and you just have to do it because you're already doing it with customers, you're already doing it with your distributors. So these are the four mental roadblocks that you need to get out of the way. You need to get rid of unrealistic expectations. Now, what you want, that you want to raise money is not, is not anybody's business. What you want is different from what the, the investors want. So, but if you can show the investors that you're an investable opportunity, then you, you can look realistic. The second is nobody wants to give me capital. As, as I already told you, nobody owes you capital. If you want to get capital, you need to convince people that your business is worthy of, of capital. And then, of course, it's a big lie that capital is scarce. It's, it's not true. There's much more money flowing across the world, even into emerging markets like Africa. There's much more foreign direct investment coming into emerging markets than ever before. We have different kinds of money. These days we have uh, digital money, there's cryptocurrency, all sorts of funds that are coming in to serve different kinds of businesses. And of course, rejection is a part of the journey you're about to get on. Now, but the interesting thing we need to look at, which is really important at this point, is why would anybody want to give you money, right? You know, I mentioned it before that money is actually looking for you. Money is actually looking for businesses that are investment opportunities. Now, why would anybody want to give you money? And I need to let you know that there are five major, five core motivations that make money look for you. And the thing is this, when you look at, this is like a snapshot of organizations, institutions, and firms that invest millions of dollars in businesses every year. There are hundreds of this. This is just a, a snapshot. Now, why would a company like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola is already a very successful company. Why would they have a foundation that's giving money to different kinds of projects and, and causes? Why would uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, Bill Gates is one of the richest people in the world, right? So why would he be interested in investing in, in projects? Um, so the, the reason why Bill Gates would give money to an entrepreneurial project is very different from uh, the reason why uh, the Blackstone Group, for example, or North Fund, or the Schwab Foundation, or even Anderson Horowitz, which is one of the biggest venture capital firms for tech businesses, would give money. So all these organizations have different motivations. You cannot pitch to them the same way. You cannot approach them the same way. You cannot send them the same proposal. Why? Because they are motivated by different things. And if you do not know what motivates an organization, then it will be very difficult to convince them to give you money. So the very first motivation is profit. Now, profit is one of the strongest motivations why anybody wants to give you um, capital or invest in your business. And the reason is this. Uh, giving money to businesses is how banks make money, for example. The banking model is very simple. They take money from depositors and they give it out as loans to businesses who pay back with interest, right? So if a bank doesn't give money, if a bank doesn't give loans, 
banks will not be a profitable business if investors do not invest their clients money they won't make they won't be able to make money for their clients so you need to understand this that there are some funding organizations that are motivated by profit and when you're speaking to them you need to show them how you can help them make money they're not interested in other things that you're doing just speak their language their language is profit and not every organization is motivated by profit as you're going to find out very soon now but the thing is you need to realize what's motivating the investor you're talking to and if you realize that profit is their core motivation you need to realize also that if they don't give out their money they can't make more money so your job is to show them how you can help them make more money these are the guys who talk about return on investment these are the guys who want to see how profitable your business is these are the guys who keep talking about your scalability your track record your cash flows and things like that so if you're before an investor who is motivated by profits the only language they will understand is to let them know how you can help them make more money now it could be a bank it could be a venture capital firm it could be an investment fund whoever but profit is a major motivator for giving money to businesses the second core motivation is foreign policy now most developed countries and you have all sorts of international NGOs even arms of the United Nations that invest and give billions of dollars to all sorts of projects and causes and even um, businesses across the world and now it's it's all about foreign policy because many of these developed countries are looking to project their power and their influence and one common way they do it is by giving money to emerging economies developing countries now in the last 10 years what we're seeing in a place like Africa is a growing influence of China and China is coming in with a lot of money investing in a lot of projects infrastructure projects public private partnerships and all sorts so at the, at the last count China has invested more than a hundred billion dollars on the African continent and the USA and Western Europe is looking to match China's influence in the world because there's all this geopolitics going on and when you are at the, at the UN General Assembly or even in the Security Council you need as many friends as you can get you need as many votes as you can get so many of these countries are, 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 are projecting their influence uh, on the African continent and they're doing it by spending a lot of money now the interesting thing I've noticed is that for decades um, countries like America the UK France many of them the approach to spending money in Africa was to give money to the government as aid right they only give money to governments but the Chinese came with a different model and they are doing the projects themselves and they're also investing in local businesses or even starting businesses on the ground and that has caused the West the US and Western Europe to change their model so what we're seeing now is these countries are looking at opportunities to invest directly in the economy they are working directly with entrepreneurs they are working directly with private companies they are working in all kinds of industries from agribusiness to real estate and all sorts so this is a major source and of course as you're going to find out later in this in this course organizations like the USAID the UK DFID the China Investment Corporations most of these funds are funded by national governments from developed countries and the main motivation for this is they want to show that they're doing a good job in this part of the world they're, they're trying to show that they are being a good ally that they're supporting social impact projects and and things like that the third core motivation is social impact now we are seeing hundreds of investors philanthropists um, corporate social responsibility programs that are investing in different kinds of businesses and projects and what they are looking for is social impact so this kind of investor is not really motivated by profits what they are looking for is the kind of social impact you're making it could be environmental protection it could be fighting illiteracy it could be providing affordable housing it could be providing much more nutritious food it could be providing food security it could be providing green energy these guys are looking for impactful projects that improve the lives of people and improve communities they are not really drawn to the profits say for example as you can see here an example would be the Miller, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or even the Coca-Cola Foundation Coca-Cola is already a very successful company it's not looking to make more money the Bill, Ga Bill Gates is already one of the world's richest people right his investments are not really for profit what he's looking at is social impact how is this changing the world how is this 
creating value? How is this solving a, a, a serious problem, a painful problem, or meeting a very basic need? So when you are before an investor who is motivated by social impact, tone down the profitability talk and speak more about the social impact, the kind of jobs you are creating, the kind of impact you're making in society, the problems you're solving in, in, in society. Are you solving hunger? Is it sanitation? Whatever it is. If you understand the motivation of the investor you're talking to, then you can speak their language. The fourth core motivator is the innovation race. And this is really exciting because we're beginning to see a lot of money flow into businesses that are driven by innovation. For example, Facebook paid $16 billion to acquire WhatsApp, right? Why would Facebook pay such an amount of money to acquire WhatsApp? It was because of the innovation that WhatsApp brought to the table, right? Microsoft acquired LinkedIn, you know, for over $20 billion. Why would Microsoft do that? It was because of the innovation that LinkedIn was bringing to the table. So there are investors that are influenced and motivated by innovation. If you're bringing innovation, if you're, if you're doing, if you're creating value in a new way, if you're doing business in a way that is different from how it's been done, there are organizations that are seeking out those kinds of businesses to invest in them. So you need to really understand if the investor you're talking to is motivated by the innovativeness of your idea, the disruptiveness of your idea, the novelty of your idea. These are interesting things you need to look out for. And then the fifth um, core motivation is government programs. Now, the thing is, Politicians want to grow the economy. They want to create jobs. They want to, and they're doing this for, for political support. They want to win the next election. And right now, especially in a place like Africa, where the unemployment problem is really serious, you need to, uh, the economies need support if they're going to continue growing. The small and medium sized businesses are the engine of the economy, even in developed countries, even in America, small businesses are the engine of the economy. And there is no way politicians can get popular support if they cannot support the engine of the economy. Small businesses create the most jobs in Africa, right? Small businesses, from the taxes that they pay, they, they contribute to the economy. From the products and services that they sell, they contribute to the economy. So businesses, um, government is always looking for interesting initiatives and programs that they use to support businesses. It could be low interest loans, it could be grants, it could be waivers, it could be some kind of support that they provide. But most of this is driven from the political angle. And what, what, do they go, what, what does the government want to see? Governments want to see how many jobs are you creating? How much value can you, can you provide? How much taxes can you pay if your business is successful? That is the language that the government wants to wants to hear so the bottom line is you need to understand the core motivations that drive the investor you're talking to if you do not know the motivation for an investor it will be very difficult to convince them imagine talking about profits to an organization that is motivated by social impact they don't care about your profit imagine talking about social impact to an organization that only cares about profit for example talking to the banks about social impact they don't care about social impact. They care about their bottom line. They care about profits, right? Imagine talking about um, uh, uh, social impact. So, uh, maybe you're doing, you're creating social impact, but you're doing it in an ordinary way. And an investor that's motivated by the by innovation is not going to be drawn to what you're saying. So your ability to speak the language that investors understand starts with understanding the motivations behind any investor you're talking to. But wait a minute, this part is really important because all money is not the same. In fact, if you can repeat it after me, just say it now, all money is not the same. There is nothing like I want $1 million or I want $10,000 or I want $5,000. All money is not the same. I can give you $10,000 in, in, in different flavors. So this is what I mean. There are three major types of money. So if you're asking for money, you need to be sure you know what you're asking for. And that is part of understanding the language that investors speak. Investors do not, investors don't just see money. They see money as types. So like I said, I can't just give you $10,000. That $10,000 can be in one of three types. So that's why there are three major types of, of, of funding you can ask for. The very first is debt. The second is equity. 
and the third is what I like to call freebie funds. And I'm now going to go ahead to explain what each of them um, represents and mean. Let's start with debt. Now, debt, for many people, this will be familiar. This is borrowed money. It's money you borrow from a bank, from an institution, from a friend, from wherever. But this is borrowed money. And of course, when money is borrowed, you have to pay it back. The person who is giving you the money expects that you pay it back, most times with interest. Another thing with debt is that the, the person who gives you debt might require collateral for security. This is common with the banks. So what the banks are saying is, I'm going to give you this money, but in the event that you cannot pay back this money, I need something of yours that I will be able to sell to recover the money that I give you. And now some people are very cross with the banks for always asking for collateral and or security. But let me explain this. There is nobody listening to my voice right now who has a bank account and has money in that bank that doesn't expect to get their money back. You don't expect to walk into a bank and ask them for your money and they tell you, I'm sorry, we lost the money. We can't give you the money. You would go berserk. You know, you all of us expect to get our money back from the banks. And this is why the banks are very conservative because the main source of funding for banks is our money. It's our money. It's everybody's money. It's the money you deposit in the bank. That's the same money that the banks give out to businesses. That's the same money that banks lend, right? So the way the bank works is the people the bank gets, gets their money from, which is us, people like you and I, we don't expect to hear stories when we walk into the bank to ask for our money, right? So when the bank is giving away our money, they are very conservative with our money. They will only give it to people that they believe will pay back that money. And even on top of that, because they're conservative, because they don't want to lose our money, they ask for collateral. And I just explained what collateral means. Collateral means if I lend you this money and you're not able to pay back, I need something of yours that I can sell. It could be a house, it could be any kind of property, it could be a guarantee, something that I can sell to recover the money. Why? Because the people who have given me this money expect their money back. That's why banks ask for collateral. So it's very important that you understand why the, the, why the banks act this way, right? Another thing about debt is that it usually comes with strict conditions and timelines. I'm sure now that I've explained how the banks work, you now understand why banks always give strict conditions and timelines. The reason they give these strict conditions is that the people who give them their money, the people who give the banks the money, which are people like you and I, we expect to get our money back. So the bank has to give out that money based on strict conditions and timelines. Now, let's look at the upside and the downside of debt so that you know if it's the kind of money you should touch. The upside of debt is it allows you to retain control and ownership of your company. The bank will never be interested in how you run your business. The bank doesn't want to be, doesn't want the seats on your board of directors. The bank will never intervene in how you run your business. Your business will remain your business. That is one key benefit of debt funding. You retain full ownership and control of your business. The downside of debt is that debt is not patient. Especially if you are a young business, you're a young startup, and your business needs breathing space because you know the way debt works. From the moment the bank gives you debt, you're likely, start, you're, you're likely going to start paying back almost immediately. You'll start paying back from the next month. And for some businesses, that is too aggressive. Some businesses need time for the money to work within the business before it starts generating you know, um, uh, cash flow. So for example, imagine you were going to start a business. You will need to buy trucks. Uh, you need to uh, maybe pay for rent and stuff like that. Your business hasn't started making money already, but the bank expects that you start paying back your loan. For that kind of business, it's just too aggressive. And if you don't have breathing space, that's, the debt can suffocate your business. The second type of funding I'd like to talk about is equity. Now, what equity means is that you, the investor gives you money in exchange for a portion of your business. It could be 10% of your business, it could be 20, it could be 30, it could be 50, it could be 70 percent of your business now the investor also the the benefit of this is that the the investor only makes money if the business makes money now compared to debt when a bank gives you a loan the bank expects you to pay back whether your business makes money or not but with equity the person giving you the money as equity will only make money if the business makes money if the business doesn't make money they don't get anything and then with equity 
because the person only makes money when you make money, there is a stronger motivation to support the business. An equity investor in your business, for example, will be very happy to support you with strategic advice, could introduce you to suppliers and distributors, could introduce you to good employees, could introduce you to more investors who will bring in equity in your company. Why? They have a stronger motivation because they know they can only make money if the business succeeds. Now, the thing with equity is, which I normally ask some of my students and clients is, because I know some people have a resistance when it comes to equity funding. So the question I ask is, would you rather have 100% of a $1 million company or would you rather have 1% of a $1 billion company? Now, if you own 100% of a $1 million company, all you have is $1 million. But if you own 1% of a $1 billion company, what you have is $10 million. So this is the mentality you need to um, you know, uh, keep in mind. And I say this because, like I said, some people have a resistance to, uh, to, to equity funding. Now, let's look at the upsides and the downsides of equity funding. You don't, need to, you don't need to pledge your house, your property, or any valuables as collateral. Uh, the downside to equity is that you, you may lose some ownership or control of your business. Now, really what control means is if you lose more than 50% of your equity, what it means is that you may not have all the say that you want in the business. You, you would need the other influential party to play a critical role to play a critical role in business but anything below 50 percent you're fine all you've lost is ownership right so ownership and control quite quite different now let's look at the third type of funding which is freebie funding now freebie funding is essentially as the name implies it's free money it's money that comes from donations from prize awards from grants you know essentially free money uh, the, the thing about freebie funding is that the donors don't expect to make any interest on, on the money they give you. Like, on like, you know, like debt, where the person who gives you money as a loan expects interest. Or like equity, where the person requires an ownership stake. Anybody who gives you freebie funding, it's essentially free money. You don't need to pay back with interest and you don't need to give up any stake of ownership in your company. Another thing with freebie funding is that there's a stronger motivation to, to, to support the business. The person who is giving you freebie funding likely is not doing it for profit, right? They're not doing it for profit. That's why they're not asking for anything in return. It's likely they're doing it for social impact reasons. It could be for foreign policy reasons. It could be for, it could be the government, right? Or it could even be for, um, for reasons of innovation, but essentially the, the people who give you freebie funding, they often give it um, with other things in, in addition. And, and I'm, I'm going to explain shortly. Now, let's look at the upside and the downsides. The upside of freebie funding is that it comes with extras. And by extras, I mean things like training, you know, mentoring, networking. These are things that entrepreneurs take for granted. Most people think that just by raising money, they can automatically solve the problems in their business. But in my experience, that's not true. Sometimes you have a sales problem. Sometimes you have a human resource problem. Sometimes it's the structure and processes in your business. That's the problem. But you think by raising funding, you're going to solve those problems. What you inadvertently do is that by the time you raise funding, those problems, that, those little problems become big problems because you've poured money on them. You've, you've raised capital and you've just poured money on them. So sometimes training is important because training helps you solve the root cause of the problem. It could be a strategy problem, it could be a sales problem, it could be a talent problem, it could be an operational problem. Training helps you. Mentoring is very good. People who give freebie funding often introduce you to much more experienced entrepreneurs, people who are well connected. So you can easily get access to suppliers, to distributors, to employees and even future investors. So the, the, the kind of extras that come with freebie funding, these are things that many entrepreneurs take for granted. But in my experience, this is the biggest benefit of freebie funding. It's not the amount of money that freebie funding gives you that's important. What's really important is what comes with the freebie funding. And that's, that's, uh, that's really what makes it exciting for me. The downside of freebie funding is that you're really going to raise small funding amounts, $5,000, $10,000, $25,000. There are a couple of big amounts that are freebie funding, grants that are up to a million dollars, but they are very rare. Most of the freebie funding you can get is small money. But like I said, the money is not really the benefit of freebie funding. 
the real benefit of freebie funding is in the extras that you get, the training, the mentoring, the networking, the advice, the strategic exposure, the media exposure. These are the key benefits that come with freebie funding. So I think the critical question at this point is, which is the best? I've just talked to you about the three major kinds of funds that exist. Like I said, like I told you before, there is nothing like I want to raise $10,000 or I want to raise $100,000. $100,000 does not exist when it comes to raising money. I used to, I, do you mean $100,000 in debt or $100,000 in equity or $100,000 in freebie funds? Or do you mean a combination of two or three of them? So if you're going to raise money, you need to speak the language that investors understand. And the language that investors, on, that investors understand is that there are three types of money. So if you're going to raise money, you need to be specific the kind of money you are asking for. If not, you'll be viewed as unready or unserious because you're just asking for money, but you don't know what kind of money you're asking for because the kind of money you ask for comes with different, comes with a, a separate consequences. They have different characteristics. They have different features. So you need to really pay attention. So the question here is, if you have to choose between these three, which one is the best? So to address this question, here's what we're going to do. There are actually three key factors you need to consider when you're raising money that would help you determine if what you need is a debt or what you need is equity or what you need is freebie. Not all kinds of money will be good for your kind of business. And you're about to understand what I mean by that statement. If you take the wrong kind of money, it can poison and kill your business. I need to say that again. If you take the wrong kind of money, it can poison and kill your business. What you're looking for is the right kind of money that can act as fertilizer in your business and help you grow and take you to the very next level. So there are three factors you need to consider in making that decision. The first is the stage of your business, and I'm going to let you know what that means in a second. The second is the cost versus the benefits of the kind of funding you want to raise. And then the third is your personal preference. So I'm going to go step by step and explain what each of these three factors mean. So let's, the very first one would be the stage of business. What stage of business are you? The stage of business you're in has a big role to play in the kind of money you can raise, the amount of money you can raise, the type of investors you can talk to. A lot of it depends on the stage of business where you are. So essentially, there are four stages of business. And every, every person listening to this introduction course right now belongs to one stage, one of the stages I'm about to show you. Now, the first stage is the idea or pre-startup stage. Now, in this stage, all you have is just an idea for a product or service that exists. The majority of people who want to start a business fall into this category. They have an idea for an agribusiness. They have an idea for a dry cleaning business. They have an idea for a logistics business. They have an idea for an interesting and amazing tech product. All you just have is an idea in your head. Or maybe you have a business plan. But essentially, the business is not yet live. By not yet live, I mean you don't have a product or service that is available for sale. Right? All you just have is a concept. You just have the framework or a prototype, but you don't have something that is ready for sale. So the business is not yet live. Another important factor in the idea of startup stage or pre-startup stage is the idea, it, the, the idea may or may not be validated. So what validation means is it's one thing to have an idea in your head that you are excited about, that you're very positive about, that you're very optimistic about. And it's another thing for somebody to pay you money for that product or service and that person doesn't have that person should not be your parents your mom your dad your siblings or somebody who is close to you somebody who is just buying it because of the social attachments they have to you what i mean by validation is having somebody in the market buy the product on its own merits because it solves a problem it meets a need or it satisfies a want let me say that again a business that has potential has one of these three characteristics it's either it solves a problem or it meets a need or it satisfies a desire or want that people have that's the only time you can say a business is validated now the second stage of the second stage of business is the startup stage now as you can see in the startup stage you've, you've broken out of the idea you are now something and um, in the startup stage it's very likely you have made 
your first few sales or you are in production mode. Now, what I mean by production mode would be, for example, an agribusiness. You have cultivated the crops on the farm and you're waiting for the harvest. So you don't, the product is not ready to be sold, but you've, you're already in production mode. You're already producing the thing you want to sell. It's very different from somebody who just has an idea. In production mode, you've already invested in farmland, you've already invested in equipment, you've already, you have some skin in the game compared to somebody who just has an idea. Uh, of course, like I said, or it could be that you've made your first few sales. It's not a lot of money coming in, but you've made your first few sales. Evidently, the business is live, and by being live, you have a real product, a real service that is market ready for people to buy. And in the, in the, in the, in the startup stage, the idea, the product should already be validated. If people have bought your product on commercial merit, then what it means is that your, 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 your product is, is validated. A common feature of startup businesses is they have teething problems. They are in survival mode. They are struggling to pay the rent. They are struggling to pay salaries. They are struggling to promote the business. They are suffering from invisibility. They don't. They have low market awareness. So they have a good product or a good service, but people don't really know about them. So and they are running out of cash. So they don't really have the money to invest in advertising or business development and, and stuff like that. Those are those are those are the common traits and features of a business that's in the in the startup stage the third category the third stage of business is a growth stage now this is an exciting stage of business because at this stage the business has gained traction so what traction means is you sold you sold 10 units of your product in january by march you're selling 15 by april you're selling 25 by july you're selling 70 so you see there is there is progression you're gradually going up there. And the interesting thing that happens in the growth stage is you are, you are getting repeat customers. You know, like I always tell my students, there are three kinds of customers. You have first-time customers, people who just come buy from you the first time. The interesting thing happens, the exciting thing happens when your first-time customers become repeat customers. So somebody buys from you the first time and then they come back. If somebody is coming back to buy from you, it's very likely they like what they bought the first time. They like the experience, they like the product, they like the service. So they are coming back to buy a second time and then they keep on coming back to buy. And then the third kind of customer is a returning customer who talks. This is a referring customer. This is a customer who buys from you and is now telling people about your product or service. The, the person is talking to their neighbors, to their friends asking them to come you know buy from so essentially it's free advertising so what you see is organic that organic growth where your customers are now doing the advertising for me for you so organically one customer becomes two customers becomes four customers that's what i mean that's how traction grows so evidently if you're already experiencing traction it's likely your sales are growing and your customer base just like i explained is growing in the growth phase is also possible that the business is profitable now not all the time and that's why i said likely profitable because there are businesses that are growing but they are not profitable at the time of recording this uber is in more than a dozen countries across the world but uber is not yet profitable even though it makes a lot of money in sales so you can make a lot of you can you can be making revenues you can make significant sales but you're not yet profitable and it's 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 normal for some businesses in some industries that the business is growing fast but the business is not is not really profitable as long as you have the cash flows to support the business it's fine you can survive without making profits but what you cannot survive without is sales and cash so as long as you're bringing in sales and there's cash rolling in you're fine so that's it for the growth stage. The fourth um, category, the fourth stage is maturity. Now, this is the stage that most people in business aspire to be because this is like the, this is like the zenith. This is like the tippy top of the market. And a, a mature business has become established in the market. They have a large customer base. They're already a well-known product or service. I can, Coca-Cola, for example, is a mature business. Coca-Cola has reached the limits of its, of, of its reach in most markets. Most people know Coca-Cola. So that's an example of a brand, a business that I know you can relate to, which is a mature business. So it's become established. Coca-Cola, for example, Coca-Cola, for example, can tell you, can estimate 
how much sales they are going to make next month and this time next year. Why? They have a history of performance, performance data that they can lean on. And that's only possible because you're an established business. More or less, your sales are, pre- uh, are predictable and quite consistent and you have reached the limits of, of your market. So that's it for the maturity stage. Now, this is the interesting part I want you to look at. Because when it comes to funding, this is how investors look at it. I call it the scorecard, right? If your business is in the idea stage or the startup stage, you are perceived as higher risk to investors, you know? And then it, it might be harder for you to raise funding from professional investors and lenders. This is the reason why most banks do not want to fund idea stage businesses or startup stage businesses because they don't yet have the consistent cash flows. They don't yet have the track record and the stability you know that they are looking for so but then that doesn't mean that businesses in the idea stage and startup stage don't raise money um, they are they actually raise money from early investors there are investors who specifically seek out idea and startup stage businesses why these investors invest early because of the potential higher reward they can make so there are investors that focus exclusively on idea stage and startup stage businesses because the earlier they invest, the larger the reward and the potential payout. Now, for the growth and maturity businesses, investors look at them as lower risk. And that's because these businesses are bringing in consistent sales. They are bringing in consistent cash. As a result, they can raise larger amounts of money from investors. They can raise significant significant amounts of money from the banks. And it's relatively easier for them to raise money. Because when you really think about it, a mature business has equipment, they have property, they can pledge that as collateral if they want collateral. A growth business and a maturity and a mature business already have the cash flows coming in from sales. So they can take a loan and then they can pay back the loan because there's money coming in. But a startup is still struggling. Their sales are not yet consistent. So they will struggle to pay back. So the kind of money that a startup needs is very different from the kind of money that a growth or maturity business needs. For example, if your business is in the idea stage or the startup stage, you will do really well with equity, equity and freebie funding. Why? Because those kinds of funds are patient. Equity would, equity gives you time because you don't need to pay back the money until the business is successful. Freebie is fine because the person who gives you the money doesn't expect you to pay back. What you don't want is debt. You cannot pay back debt as a startup or idea stage business because you don't have the sales, you don't have the cash to settle debt. So you need to run away from debt if you're in the idea stage or the startup or the, or the startup stage. In the growth and maturity stage, equity will be too expensive because the risk in your business is much lower. Businesses in the growth and maturity stage enjoy debt. They do debt really well because what debt means is you're, you're going to do business with other people's money. The banks give you other people's money and because you already have the sales and the cash coming in, you can settle the debt and it works really well for them. Most businesses in the growth and maturity stage, they do really well with debt. That's if, you're in, if your business is in, a, is in a traditional industry. So that's it for the stage of business. Let's look at the second of the three factors I talked about, which is the cost versus the benefits of debt versus equity versus freebie. So let's look at this now. Let's, let's look at the cost of each of the three types of funds. The cost of freebies is zero, you know? It doesn't cost you anything. The person who is giving you the money doesn't expect it back. The cost of debt is less expensive than the cost of equity. Equity is more expensive than debt in the, in the pecking order, in the hierarchy, right? And then let's look at the benefits. When it comes to freebie, you get major non-financial benefits. Uh, most um, organizations that give grants and prize awards, they provide training, they provide mentoring, they provide opportunities to network with other entrepreneurs and even with uh, much more experienced entrepreneurs and business people. They give you exposure, they give you media exposure, they give you strategic exposure. All of these are benefits, although they are non-financial, but they are important. When it comes to debt, debt has most times zero non-financial benefits. The bank is not going to provide training for you. The bank is not interested in mentoring you. The bank is not interested in giving you strategic advice. Why? A debt, a loan is an obligation. 
whether the business succeeds or not, you must pay back the loan. That's why there's no incentive for the bank to give you training or mentoring or give you networking. The bank must get back their money because a debt is an obligation. But compared to equity, that's why equity gives, equity provides um, major non-financial benefits. The person who gives you equity will not make money except the business is successful. The person who gives you equity will not make money unless the business is successful. That's why they have the motivation to, to support you, give you advice, help you with mentoring. They can coach you. They can introduce you to suppliers, to distributors, to good employees. So there are major non-financial benefits that come from equity. So here you have it. This is a comparison of the cost versus the benefits of the three types of funding. Now, it depends on where your business is. It depends on what your needs are, and what the needs of your business are. Sometimes you need more than money. Sometimes you need more than capital. Sometimes you really need training. You need, you need, um, you need access to a network of people who will expose you, even to find future investors who will help you with issues around supply, around your sales, who will help you get into distribution channels that will be difficult for you to get into on your own. So this is a choice you need to make. Most times, the benefits are not purely financial. You also have other non-financial benefits. And then, so here you have it. This is a comparison of the cost versus the benefit of the three types of funding. Now, we've looked at the stage of business. We've looked at the cost versus the benefits. Now, let's look at personal preference. And this is very important because... In fact, I need you to pay very close attention to this. When it comes to pre personal preference, the question you need to ask is, what type of business are you building? Now, all of us are not the same. The reason I started my business is likely very different from the reason you started your business, right? So all of us are different. So that's why this is a personal question. What kind of business, what type of business are you building? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you four different kinds of businesses that most entrepreneurs build. If you're listening, if you're watching this, this lesson, if you're watching this course, it's very likely the reason you have your business is for one of the four reasons I'm about to explain. So the very first type of business that most entrepreneurs build is a cash flow business. In fact, this is the most common type of business that people build. And simply put, this is a business that supports your lifestyle. It's a business that you need to support to pay your bills. It's a, it could be a side job. You, you are keeping your main job and then it's a side job. Or maybe it's your full-time business. But the reason you're running this business is for financial sustenance, for financial support. So this is just a business that you need to pay your bills essentially to take yourself on a vacation. You're just doing it for the money. It's not, let's just keep it plain. You're just doing it for the money, right? So if this is, if you're building a cash flow business, essentially what it means is, you have to be dispassionate, whether it's freebie funding, debt funding, or equity funding. You just have to choose which one helps you maximize your ability to squeeze out cash flow from the business because it's all about the money. You just need it to pay your bills. So the, the kind of funding that helps you maximize the cash flow is the one you go for. The second kind of, the second type of business that entrepreneurs build is a legacy business. And now, there are examples of these businesses across the world. There's Ford, Dangote, Walmart, Mahindra. Now, what a legacy business means is it's a business you want to leave for the next generation. Essentially, it's a family business. It's a business you want to hand over to your kids when you're no longer around. So, like I said, it's very common with family businesses. And these kinds of businesses prefer debt and freebie. Now, why do they, why do they like debt? Now, remember, the person who is giving you debt, like a bank, when a bank gives you a loan, they don't want any stake of ownership in your company. They don't want to have control. They don't intervene. They don't, they don't get involved in your business. And that's the kind of relationship that legacy businesses want. The owner of a legacy, uh, of a legacy business wants control because it's that, it's that control that allows you to pass on the business to the next generation. If you, if you have somebody who has large equity in the business it might be difficult to pass on that business to the next generation because there'll be conflict right you're sharing a business with somebody you can't just take it all for yourself and hand it over to your kids so to somebody who has a legacy business control is very important to them ownership is very important to them that's why most of them focus a lot on the debt and the freebie kind of funding legacy businesses are very common in 
in, in the Middle East, the Indians are very big on legacy. The, uh, in, in the Middle East, the Lebanese, for example, very big on legacy. And I'm saying this because of the, a, a conversation that's going on right now about legacy businesses in Africa. So you have a business that's doing really well. The founder started his business from scratch doing really well. By the time he or she hands it over to their kids, to the next generation, they run down the business. So it's very difficult in Africa to see businesses that have moved from generation to generation. And so it has a lot to do with succession planning and a couple of other things. But the reason I'm bringing this up is if this is the kind of business you want to run or if this is the kind of business you're building, you need to be deliberate from the very beginning. If it's a business you're handing over to the next generation, you have to start getting the next generation involved. You have to make smart choices about the kind of capital you take, about the kind of funding you take. And this is the time to make that decision, not, not later. The third type of business that people, that entrepreneurs build is a venture business. And of course, you already see some examples here. You see Paystack, WhatsApp, PayPal, Instagram. Now, what a venture business means is you intentionally build a business to sell it. So you start a business, you run it for three years, four years, five years, seven years, or even 10 years. And in all that time you're building, you're, you're building that business, you are growing the value of the business. So you started a business from nothing. And in five years, you're able to sell the business for a lot of money. So take Paystack, for example. Paystack is a Nigerian startup. You know, I'm, I'm going to still talk about it later in the advanced course, but this is a Nigerian company that was started by two young entrepreneurs, both of them be, below 30 years old. They started a business, they ran it for four years, and in December 2020, the company was acquired for $200 million by Stripe, uh, a US-based um, payments company. So you build a business for four years from nothing, right? Build a business for four years and then it's acquired for $200 million. So this is an approach to, to business, venture building, where you need to grow the business as fast as possible because you want to sell it. Maybe you want to sell it so you can go on an early retirement. You want to sell it so that you can start another business. You want to sell it so that you can use the money to create something else. You know, so take Elon Musk, for example. Elon Musk was in PayPal. They sold PayPal to eBay. And most of the money Elon Musk got from that deal, from selling PayPal, that's the money he used to start his rocket company, SpaceX, and then, the, uh, and then Tesla, right? So there are people who think that way. They don't want to be in the business for a long time. They have no interest in handing over the business to the next generation. They just want to build a business and sell it. So for this kind of, for this kind of business, the best kind of, of, of funding will be equity because it's not just about the money. You need people who have the skills, people who have the exposure, the market access, who can introduce you to more investors. You want people to take ownership in the business. Somebody who's building a venture business would rather have 1% of a, of, a, of a $1 billion business than have 100% of a, a $1 million business. So for these kinds of people, they don't mind owning minority stakes in the company as long as they grow and enlarge the pie. So that's the goal for a venture, a venture business. And then the, the, other, the fourth kind of business, the fourth type of business I want to talk about is a, is a rather philosophical type of business. I call them the big vision business. Now, of course, from the faces you can see there, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. These are businesses that are focused on long-term change. Amazon, for example, wants to become the world's you know, largest retail store. These days, you can buy almost anything on Amazon. Amazon even, even bought a green grocery chain, Whole Foods, right? So Amazon wants to dominate. Amazon keeps buying smaller companies. Same with Facebook. Facebook bought WhatsApp, bought Instagram. Facebook wants to change the way human beings communicate. Facebook wants to dominate how human beings communicate. That's why they, keep, they paid $16 billion for WhatsApp. They paid $1 billion for Instagram. And then Facebook is still, is still going to acquire more companies in the future. I don't think Mark Zuckerberg would ever want to sell that company, at least not while he's young, because he's focused on long-term change. Same thing with Tesla. Tesla has transformed the automobile industry. Tesla is now a pioneer in, elect in, in electric vehicles. Same as SpaceX. He started the business. He started SpaceX, a rocket company, as an outsider. He, he says he wants to, he wants to send a, a human civilization 
to Mars and people laughed him off. Today, SpaceX is one of the biggest contractors to NASA, right? So these are people who are focused on long-term change. They are not interested in selling the company. Many of them are not interested in handing over the company as a legacy business to the next generation. They are not running it for cash flow. It's not about the money. It's about the change. And in this kind of businesses, the leader wants to stay in control of the vision. So to them, it's important to maintain that control. They might take equity, but not equity that dilutes their control. They will take debt. They will take freebie. But the most important thing in a, vis in a big vision business is you want to take money from people who align with your vision, from people who see what you see. You don't want to take money from people who just want profit, who just want money. They don't believe in your vision. They just see you as a money-making venture. No, these kinds of people will only take money from believers. They will only bring people on board who, who align with the vision of the company. So essentially, these are, these are the important things you need to keep in mind when it comes to choosing the kind of funds, the kind of money you want to raise. What type of business are you building? Are you building the business for cash flow? If you're building for cash flow, the kind of money, the type of money you should take will be different. Are you building it for family? Is it for legacy? Are you building it to sell? Or are you building it as a big vision, transformation, disruption business for the very long term? So these are the three key factors that determine what kind of money you want to raise. And essentially what this means is that if you make the wrong move, you could end up taking money that could poison and hurt your business. What you need is to make the right choice when it comes to raising funds for your business that aligns with your stage of business, that provides more benefits than costs, and suits your personal preferences for the very long term. So at this point in this course, we have covered the basics of raising funds. Now you understand what the mental roadblocks are. Now you know what the core motivations for, for giving you money are. And the, the goal is, if you know the motivation of the investor, you can speak their language. Now you know the three types of funds that exist. There's equity, there's debt, there's freebie. There is nothing like, I want to raise $10,000 or I want to raise $1 million. What kind of $1 million? Is it $1 million in equity, $1 million in debt? $1 million in freebie. And then, of course, there are different factors that would influence that. What stage of business are you in? Are you in the idea stage, the startup stage, the growth stage, or the maturity stage, right? What are the costs and the benefits of raising that money? And then what kind of business are you building? Are you building for cash flow? Are you building your business as a legacy business? Are you building to sell? Are you building a venture? Or are you in a big vision business, which could be for profit or non-profit? So at this point, the other four steps of the roadmap, we still have four more steps to go. Knowing your risk profile, knowing how to target the right investors, knowing how to craft compelling proposals, and knowing how to close the deal. All of these are covered in the advanced course. And in the advanced course, I'm going to cover all the other four steps so that you really understand what it takes to raise money successfully from potential investors. For example, when it comes to knowing your risk profile, this is very important because when investors say they are not going to invest in your business because it is too risky, what do they mean by risk? You see, what exactly do they mean by risk? Now, risk is a very interesting term. It's a very interesting concept because as somebody who often works at the meeting point between investors and entrepreneurs, there is a very strange disparity between how entrepreneurs see risk and how investors see risk. For example, here's what I mean. When you're talking to an entrepreneur, the way entrepreneurs see risk is that everything will go well. My business idea is going to work. It's going to make a lot of money. I'm going to get a lot of customers. It's going to be very profitable. We're going to grow. We're going to scale. I have tried and tried and tried, but I have still not been able to find an, an entrepreneur who believes that their business is not going to work. Every entrepreneur I know and I've ever seen, and including the ones I, I still haven't seen, most entrepreneurs by nature are optimists. They are optimistic people. They believe everything is going to work. If you look at their business plans, the financial projections, the sales projections, everything is looking up, 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 up. So the typical entrepreneur believes everything will go well. Now, when it comes to investors, investors see risk in a slightly different way. And what an investor is thinking is, what could go wrong? So unlike the entrepreneur who is an optimist, 
an investor is investors are not pessimists what investors are is they are realists an investor is a realist because they're asking okay i i see i like your business idea it makes sense i see your projections i see your strategy all of this makes sense but what could go wrong that's how investors think because if anything goes wrong they lose their money and because they could lose their money they're always looking for what areas things could go wrong now don't get me wrong this doesn't mean that investors will not invest they will invest but they will only invest only when they see the all clear as long as there is no major there's no major risk involved so when it comes to risk when investors hear when the investor hears from you you pitch your business idea you talk about your business talk about your projections your financial performance the natural reaction in the investor is desire you know they want to invest they want to invest they like what you're saying but then there is a counter force in the investor's mind which is doubt right so because most investors are trained to critically look at things they share your optimism as the entrepreneur but they are realists they are not optimists so they have to they have to make sure that things are balanced so there are doubts in their mind and how can you address these doubts you have two interesting opportunities to do that and that's because any investor who is interested in your business will do two things they will ask questions and they would have reactions sometimes when i train entrepreneurs one normal one normal feeling i get is they don't want questions now questions are the best thing that can happen to you after you engage an investor because only interested people ask questions think about it if an investor is not interested if somebody is not even a customer if you're trying to sell something to a customer and the customer is not interested they're not going to really see anything they're going to look for the quickest way to get rid of you and go ahead with their lives right only interested people ask questions only interested people have reactions so when an investor asks you a question they are trying to address the doubts that they have they're trying to address the fears that they have they're trying to address the skepticism that they have so questions are your opportunity your, are your opportunity to shine as an entrepreneur reactions and a reaction from an investor whether positive or negative is an invitation for you to you know address the doubts that they have so it's always a good thing when you have questions after you engage an investor maybe you send a business plan or you pitch to them and they ask you questions it's always a good thing if they ask you questions because questions give you the opportunity to shine questions give you the opportunity to show that you're you're credible that you're competent that you understand your market you understand your business model you understand your sales you understand your numbers you are capable you're going to use their money judiciously you are a safe bet that's exactly what questions are so questions come from investors thinking about the different kinds of risk in your business and when it comes to risk there are seven critical risks investors look for in any business it doesn't matter if you're in agribusiness if you're in real estate if you're in fashion or tech most investors look at seven areas of critical risk it doesn't matter if it's a bank or an investment firm or even if you're applying for a government grant most of them are going to look at these seven areas of risk and in the advanced course you will have the opportunity to look at all the critical areas and get your risk score playing a role by by, by taking this um, in, by using this investment readiness checklist you'll be able to compute your risk score you know where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are in your business you will know where investors are very likely going to ask you questions so that's why this is very important having the investment readiness checklist will allow you compete compute your risk score it's a diagnostic tool i use for my for my high-end clients and my students so that they instantly know you instantly know if you're investment ready you instantly know if you're ready for investment and you instantly know where the problems are where the gaps are and i show you how to address those gaps so this is like having the 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 answers to the questions you know this is like taking a look taking a peek into an investor's mind that's what this investment readiness checklist does for you it's a set of 68 questions right 68 questions about different aspects of your business focused on the seven areas of critical risk and at the end of the day you will know your risk score if your score is below is below 50 percent there's work to be done if your score is above 50 percent well done what it means is that you are you are investment ready so that's one benefit you get from from taking the um the 
the investment readiness from using the investment readiness checklist in the advanced course so that's it in the very third step which is targeting the right investors what i'm going to show you in the advanced course are the top 15 sources of funding for any business now when most people think about raising money they just think about banks the banks are just one there are 14 more so in the next in the in the advanced course i'm going to show you what the 15 major sources of funding are and the interesting thing is i'll show you what the features are so that you can identify each source of funding and better still i'm going to be showing you specific real life examples this is not theory these are specific real life examples of entrepreneurs from across the african continent from nigeria to ghana ethiopia south africa tanzania namibia sudan people who have used each of these 15 different sources to raise money for their businesses um, i'm also going to do something really interesting for each funding source because remember what i told you not every investor is right for you you need to be able to know how to target the right investor so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you the upsides and the downsides of each source of funding so you can make the right choice for your kind of business every business is different what you want is very different from what another person may want so that's why i want to balance the opinion i'm not pushing you to any specific one i'm going to show you the benefits and also going to show you the downsides right so the interesting thing here is that we have compiled a catalog an interesting catalog it's called the africa hot 100 so we've profiled 100 of the top organizations that invest billions of dollars in all kinds of businesses in Africa every year. So the interesting thing you're going to see from this catalog, we cover all the major 15 sources of, of, of funding and there are about 100 organizations, 100 firms in there that consistently give money, that consistently invest debt, equity and freebie funding in different kinds of African businesses. So these are 100 specific targets you can start targeting immediately your, the, the catalog contains their contact information and it also shows you how you can apply. So this is the benefit you get from participating in the advanced course. And then, of course, after, uh, after, after step three, I would also move into step four. And step four is very important, very interesting. Knowing how to craft compelling proposals is very important because of this. Now, what you're looking at is a study from the Harvard Business Review that analyzed how investors spend their time, right? So they, they study the number of investors and analyze how they spend their time. What is really interesting is what's highlighted there within the, within the red box. Investors spend just 5% of their time selecting business opportunities and then they spend another 5% analyzing business plans. So what does this tell you? What this means is that you have a very short window to impress a potential investor. If you do not use that opportunity well, they are going to dump your business plan in the trash. They are going to stop listening to you. They are going to not reply to your email. So you cannot afford not to be compelling. Your proposal has to be compelling. Your pitch has to be compelling. And this is what I mean by compelling. These are samples of uh, pitch decks and business plans from my clients, from some of my students, right? So the job of a pitch deck is very different from the job of a business plan. In fact, here's the secret. Nobody, no investor is going to read your business plan. No investor is going to read your 60 page business plan, 100 page business plan. They're just busy people. They're not going to read business plans. There's only one kind of investor who reads a business plan. There's only one kind of investor who would set out their time and invest their time in reading a 60-page business plan or a 100-page business plan. That type of investor is an interested investor. So how do you get an investor interested enough to want to read the full details of your business? The secret lies in your pitch. Now, it could be a pitch deck like you see here in PowerPoint. It could be an email pitch. It could be a pitch over the phone. It could be a pitch, maybe you, you've run into an investor at a conference, at the airport lounge, in an elevator somewhere. Your pitch is the appetizer. Your pitch is what whets the appetite of the investor to want to read your business plan. Your pitch is what sparks interest and curiosity in the investor. And like I always tell my students, interest always comes before the investment. Interest always comes before the investment. Only an interested investor will go ahead to ask you questions, learn more about your business before they invest. 
non-interested people don't invest. So don't look for the money first. Your first focus should be to get the investor interested in your business. If they are interested, then you can move them from interest to asking for their money. But going ahead to ask for their money without confirming their interest is a failing strategy. It's, a, it's, it's guaranteed to, to take you to failure. So that's why I, I thought it was really important to show you this. And inside of the advanced course, you're really going to... I'm going to show you samples of real life business plans, real life pitch decks that have been used to raise money. And so this is exactly what you're going to get in the advanced course when it comes to showing you how to craft compelling proposals. You're going to understand the 10 things that make a good pitch, right? If you're going to pitch to somebody, you have between two to five minutes. It doesn't matter if it's over the phone, on social media, you meet the person maybe at the airport in an elevator at a conference. There are 10 things you need to cover in your pitch to make it compelling, to make it strong enough to generate interest and curiosity. I'm also going to show you the structure of a business plan. Some business plans, most business plans actually are very boring. And because they are boring, most investors don't read them. I'm going to show you how to structure a business plan so it is interesting and inviting to an investor. They read it and they just can't drop it because it's very engaging. It's very targeted, it speaks the right language, so I'm going to show you the, how to structure a compelling business plan or proposal. I'm also going to show you a real life sample of a pitch and business plan that was used to raise money. So these things are not theory, you know? So, so like I said, in the advanced course, knowing how to craft a compelling proposal, whether it's a pitch or a business plan, very, very important. It's critical to your success um, as long as you want to raise money. And then, of course, we get to the very last step, the fifth step of the, of the roadmap, which is closing the deal. Now, closing an investment deal is very important because I've seen people who have done a good job of understanding the basics. They know their risk profile. They are targeting the right investors. They have very compelling proposals, but something happens. The investor tells them they are interested, they are going to invest, but the money never comes. They wait one day, two days, three weeks, four weeks. The money never comes. Why? Why did the money not come even after the investor said they were interested? Now, what I find is there are essentially five areas that could make a deal not close. Even after you've done a good job of crafting a compelling proposal and doing all the things you're supposed to do. The first area is due diligence, right? What this means essentially is that no, most investors are going to come to confirm what you have said. If you said you've been making revenues of $1 million or $100,000, they will want to see your bank statements. They will want to see your audited accounts. They're going to ask questions. They're going to do their background checks. They're going to try to reach out to your customers, to your potential competitors. And then sometimes if they find something that doesn't align with what you said, or it looks like you're not a credible person, they're going to develop code feet. So due diligence is an area that most entrepreneurs skip because they're not paying attention. And in the advanced course, I'm going to show you how to make sure that you go through the due diligence step in a way that increases the confidence that the investors have in you and allows them, gives them the peace of mind that they need to actually release the money that you're asking for. Another area that causes problems when it comes to deal closing is the negotiation strategy. So sometimes you're not able to handle the negotiation very well. Maybe the investor is asking for 20% and then you are only comfortable with giving away 10%. How do you handle that negotiation without alienating the other side? How do you handle the negotiation so that you get a win-win outcome, so that you get the investor's money and then also give them something that they want? So negotiation strategy is an area that many entrepreneurs falter. Another big area where people make mistakes is the legal aspect of closing the deal. Now, guess what? When it comes to raising money, most entrepreneurs focus on the money. They are focused on that $50,000, that $100,000, that $1 million. They're thinking of what they can do with the money, how they can expand the business, hire more people, buy more equipment. They're focused on the money. But guess what investors are focused on? Guess what the bank is focused on? The bank is focused on the contract. The investor is focused on the contract because it's the contract that defines the relationship. Forget everything you have said during the conversations and the pitch and all that. It's the, it's the, it's the, contract, that, it's the contract that defines the relationship. And that's the reason why the bank always wants to write the contract. 
the investor always wants to write the contract because that's how you control power that's how you manage risk that's how you control money who gets what we've seen entrepreneurs who raise money and two or three years later they were they were kicked out of their companies why did that happen they didn't look at the contract it's because of what they signed so you cannot say you are you are delegating this job to your lawyer your lawyer can protect you legally but you are the guy whose signature is going to be on that contract you need to understand the the dynamics the power play that goes into the legal aspect so in the advanced course i'm not going to, of course i'm not trying to turn you i'm not going to turn you into a lawyer but i'm going to show you the areas you need to pay attention to before you sign any investment deal very this is a very important detail that many entrepreneurs miss i'm going to show you the critical areas to look out for the questions to ask your lawyer so that you make sure that your interest is protected and you are not exposed because of your ignorance to the legal matters the fourth area that causes problems and hiccups including an investment deal is the valuation of the business so this is typically common in equity equity um, deals for example if you're offering the investor 25 percent of your of your company in exchange for hundred thousand dollars on what basis did you come to the 25 percent i if you're offering 25 percent of your company for hundred thousand dollars what it means is that you're valuing your company at what now four hundred thousand dollars yes that's what it means so but how did you get to that valuation so valuation is a common area of contention when it comes to closing a deal because the investor does not understand why you think your business is worth 10 million dollars or 100 million dollars and you cannot justify your, your your valuation so in the advanced course i'm going to show you the range of options you have when it comes to value and putting a value on your business and how you can defend your valuation how you can justify your valuation in a way that the investor will be unable to argue with you because you make sense because your valuation is logical and it makes sense so one common area that alienates investors is when your valuation is unrealistic you're saying your company is worth 10 million dollars 1 million dollars and you just cannot justify logically why you're worth that much it then looks like you're trying to pull a fast one on the investor you're trying to take advantage of of the investor so it's true that business valuation is subjective but in the advanced course i'm going to show you how you can come to a business valuation that makes sense so that nobody feels um, that, they're, that they're being cheated and of course the final stage is the persuasion strategy how you are able to persuade the investor to make up their mind and eventually release the money to you raising money is all about selling it's all about persuasion and if you don't know what strings to pull what to say how to say it and things like that you may find it really difficult to get the money that you're looking for so these are the remaining five steps that we're going to cover in the advanced course the advanced course is for people who are trying to raise money whom you've listened to you've you've, you've just watched this introduction course i've taught this countless times and um, the interesting thing about the the funding master class is that it's something that's that i that i started out of concern for the struggles that I, I saw that many of my students were going through. Many people have trouble with raising funding. And this is not really something that is taught the way it should be. In the way that the normal guy on the streets, the normal entrepreneur would understand in practical steps. I wanted to teach something that is practical and easy to understand. And that is why I've been able to get a lot of amazing results with my students and my clients through the funding masterclass but let me tell you more about let me tell you about the uh, the funding masterclass the advanced course is 100 percent online you don't need to travel anywhere you don't need to show up anywhere i've taught it this way to more than 50,000 people it's 100 percent online you have access to the platform you log in and then you start your your, your training also no previous experience is required you don't need to be an accountant you don't need to be a finance person the assumption is that you don't know anything about any of this so the training takes you from basic to advanced so there is no previous experience that's required all that's really required is that you have a burning passion or desire to make your business succeed either to start your business to grow your business or expand your business the other thing about the advanced course is that it is self-paced learning right so you learn at your own pace 
So you must not log in at any particular time. And most of the people who go through the funding masterclass are from across the world. They are in different time zones, right? So the, the, the advanced course, the masterclass is designed to allow you learn at your own pace. So there is no pressure to finish it in any one time. Yes, you can finish the masterclass in one week if you give it your full attention. You can finish it in one month. You can finish it in two months. You can even finish it in one year. It's up to you how you want to progress. The other interesting thing is that you can ask as, you can ask any question you want and get answers, which is really important because sometimes people take courses and then uh, because every business is different, because everybody is different, you're going to have questions that you want to ask. So inside of the platform area, instead of the course area, you can ask your questions. There's a comment section below every lesson of the course. You can ask any question and then somebody on the team definitely will get back to you. And sometimes you may even see somebody, another student in, who's taken the course who has had a similar experience to yours or has an answer to your question. So it's important for that interaction to, to keep going. Now, I can imagine the elephant in the room. How much is the funding masterclass? Now, it's only $39 per month. And the reason it's come down that low is so that anybody can, no matter your stage of business, you can have access to the funding masterclass. The funding masterclass is normally priced at $49.99. But I can imagine that this is quite a steep price point for many people who are struggling to start or grow their business, where there's a cash crunch. So just like many other platforms that are subscription-based, like Netflix and the rest, with only $39 per month, you can access the, the course area and complete the funding masterclass. Ask any questions you want um, and, and learn, at your, learn at your own pace. So it's really about access, right? So if you can afford $39 this month, fine. You can pay and then when next you can afford, you can. So it's an access based, it's a subscription based class. It's a subscription based course. So because most people cannot pay $4.99 with just $39 per month, you don't have any excuse. No excuse, absolutely no excuse for you not to gain the benefits that come from the, the funding masterclass. And again, I must remind you, this has helped dozens of my clients get results to date. We've Cumulatively, my clients and my students have raised more than $5 million. So this thing works. But it's not just the amount of money that they've raised. It's the kind of progress that they've made. For example, take Anne. For example, Anne was, a, a, was one of the um, top contenders for the um, Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation that's organized by the Royal Academy of Engineering. You know, So she, she, she traveled from Kampala in Uganda to the UK to go pitch. And she was one of the finalists. In the in the royal in, in that prize, she was featured on CNN on and on and on the BBC. And then you have Maxwell who won the Sisters World Competition in Ghana. There's uh, Mohammed Kamsa, Somalia. He, he he came first after competing with several different businesses. Um, there are all sorts. There's Connects in the DLC that has raised almost a million dollars. There's Musa in the Gambia. I can go on and on and on and on. So, like I said, it's not just about the money they've raised. It's about what these businesses have been able to accomplish just because they got that added confidence to go out there, compete for capital, and they got the capital. And that's really what transformed their businesses. And besides the funding raised, 50,000 people have already gone through this program in physical and virtual audiences. Uh, I, I was traveling pre-COVID and even after COVID, I've delivered this masterclass in several different locations within Nigeria and outside Nigeria in different parts of Africa. So it's really a no-brainer. It's 100% online. It's virtual. No experience is required. It's self-paced. You can ask any questions you want. It is only $39 per month compared to the normal tag price of $49.99. You have absolutely no excuse. You need to start taking the advanced course right now so that you can overcome the funding challenges that your business faces. Imagine what finally raising money could do for your business idea. Imagine what you could do for your small business, for your mid-sized business. Imagine raising the funding you've been looking for to take your business to the very next level. Just imagine what you could do. I've seen that happen for several different people. It's a very amazing feeling. It's a, it's, it's, it's a feeling that is beyond description. And it's a feeling I want you to have. 
by going through this process, by going through the five-step process of the roadmap, you can eventually get what you need to raise the funding that you're looking for. So it just, uh, it, 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 it gets me really excited. Um, but I, I look forward to having you inside of the, of the funding masterclass. I can't wait to blow your mind with the things you're going to learn. So if you're ready to join us, follow the link on the screen right now. Follow the link on the screen right now. And um, I can't wait. Uh, it could be on the screen below this video, wherever. But this link at, on, the, on the small startup website, this is how you get, you, you, you can join us at smallstarter.com slash 777. Smallstarter.com slash 777. That's how you can join the uh, funding masterclass for the advanced course. And if you've been referred by somebody, one of our affiliates has referred you, when you're checking out, when you're about to put in your card details, don't forget to reference the coupon code of the person who referred you. I really look forward to having you on board in the funding masterclass. I enjoyed creating this introduction course. Even if you don't join, I can already imagine that you can you can achieve something with some of the knowledge that um, I've shared here. And um, I look forward to having you. It will be it will be a tremendous joy to work with you and help you get the results you're looking for. So until the very next time, I wish you all the very best. Take care of yourself. Never stop believing. Entrepreneurs are optimists. Um, and that's exactly what makes us what we are. So don't, never give up on your dreams. And if you're one of those people who eventually joined the masterclass, I can't wait to take you on the remaining four steps of the roadmap so that you too can join the list of success stories that I've had with my clients and my students. Take care of yourself. Cheers.